you remain standing for the reading of God's word this morning. Hallelujah. The word today is taken from an Old Testament book. Books sometimes that we don't often read, but it is one of those small books in that in that decalogue taken from Lamentations, the third chapter, the 22nd and the 23rd verses. That's Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23 from the New King James Version. And it reads on this wise. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Can we hear that again one more time? Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great, great, oh God, is your faithfulness. The word of God. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of almighty God. And for a title this morning, I would like to use Faithful to the End. Faithful to the End. Church, I have looked at this book before, but never in the way God has given me eyes to see it now. This little small book, only five chapters, sandwiched in between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I thought this was interesting that in between those two powerful books, those lengthy books, that God would place this short poem, and you know that this book is a poem, that God wrote through the prophet Jeremiah for the people of God at that time, which were Jerusalem, but in actuality, he wrote that for us today. In times like these, saints, we need a savior. In times like these, we do need a deliverer. In times like these, we do need a healer. And our anchor can only hold when we have that rock that is Jesus the Christ. Amen? This particular book, as I just said, written by Jeremiah, is called an acrostic book. It is formatted acoustically in the Hebrew language. And what that means, it is formatted in a way that it gives you the A, B, C's, and D's. Amen? Amen. It takes you back to the very foundation for which God has done his perfect work. Amen? But interestingly enough, as you read this book, you will find that it lists the A, B, C's all the way through Z of human suffering the frailty of our human condition. Jeremiah, who is called the weeping prophet, the weeping prophet, lamented, lamentations. He lamented over the condition and the circumstances that were facing Israel at this particular time. Jerusalem laid in ruins. The temple had been destroyed, desecrated. Babylon had come in and taken everything. The people of God had been carried away into bondage. Do you think there's any reason why they have to lament? Do you think there's any reason why they have to cry? Do you think there would be any reason for the prophet to mourn? Amen. But I want you to know just like Jeremiah was weeping for the conditions of the people at that day, God is weeping for us today. Violence in our streets. I don't think you heard me. Gun violence in our streets. I have not woken a day in the last three weeks that I have not heard of a shooting. How about you? A pandemic that still has not relented. We are still in conditions of sorrow. Many are still burying loved ones each and every week. You heard the reports. The prayer list was lengthy today, amen? And it was lengthy because each and every day we are faced with trials and tests and tribulations and sorrows and anguish and suffering. And sometimes we just don't know what to do. Sometimes we hang our head in, in, in complete and total amazement as how well and how sad this world has gone. 
But I want you to know today that God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, and today he's still speaking. We have a living Savior, and he is faithful to the end. He will never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. Take a look at this for a moment. In these five chapters of Lamentation, the first chapter, the second chapter, and the fourth chapter start with the words how. And in the Hebrew language, the reason why it starts with how is because it's saying how long. Have you ever asked God how long? Have you ever thought about the situations that we're going through and sometimes say, how can I make it through? How am I going to put two coins together to pay for a meal? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to get up when my body is racked with pain and go to work successfully? How am I going to deal with my way with children? How am I going to deal with my crazy husband or my crazy wife? Yeah, I said it. Mm -hmm. How? And I thought it was very interesting as I was reading this that this was Jeremiah. In general, he was talking about what the nation of Israel was going through, but he was also talking about the conditions that we face when we fail to heed God's word. Israel was not in this predicament because they had been so good, saints. Israel was in this predicament because they had disobeyed God. Forty years the prophet Jeremiah prophesied to these people, and they still were stiff-necked and stubborn. Anybody out here know you got some stiff-necked, stubborn stuff going on? And the prophet continued to lament. It is only in the middle of these five chapters that we begin to see some relief. It's in this third chapter. Now, if you go back and read it for yourself, you'll see, I mean, Jeremiah just kept, kept talking about the problem. And how many of you know many times we spend so much time talking about the problem that we fail to see the solution? If you look at those chapters, all he kept doing was talking about what was happening, what was going on, how God had forsaken them, how God was no longer on their side, how God had turned them over, how God had left them alone, how God was punishing them, how their temple was gone, how their enemies were victorious over their lives. How, 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 Lord? And then in the midst of that how, I had a why. Why, Lord? When this pandemic first hit, I asked, Lord, why? Why? Have we done something for which you are judging us? And most of us won't always be honest to say that we're asking that question. But there is a human side of us that needs to deal with it. And that's why God allowed Jeremiah to write, because he wanted us to see that God's people are human. And that there are time periods where you will go through situations and circumstances when you are forced to ask how and why. What have I done? Why am I going through this? And every time it's not because God is judging you or judging your situation. But we are living in a fallen world and I think we forgot that. This world does not belong to God anymore. It did in Genesis 1 and 2, but in Genesis 3, Slootfoot, Satan, that mangy creature, came in and tempted Eve, and Eve was enticed, and she gave in to the temptation. And because of it, not only she fell, not only Adam fell, but whole mankind was corrupted from that time forth. And I want you to know most people believe that God came back and did something through Jesus Christ that saved this world, but he did not. Yes, he's still sovereign. Yes, he's still transcendent. Yes, he's still imminent. Amen. And transcendent means he created this world. He's over this world. He knows everything that's going on in this world. Amen. But his imminence means that he's working within the people of God in this world. That's you and I. We got to change our perception, saints. I asked you a question. 
How many of you know God is faithful? That's not enough amens. So I take that to mean some of you have not experienced his faithfulness. Because I want you to know to understand the ways of God, you have to have an experience with God. You have to have a personal, downright epiphany experience with God. Amen? And then you can have a different perception and perspective of what God is doing. And in the midst of challenges, you can say, God is faithful. <laughs> when it don't look good, God is faithful. When my money is funny, God is faithful. <laughs> when I'm sick in my body and fever is racking me, God is faithful. When my head is hanging low, God is still faithful. Because the only thing that does not change is God. We change. Situations change. Circumstances change. People change. But the God we serve cannot change. And that's a confidence that we have in his faithfulness. I want you to think about your perception and your perspective of how things look. Do you know two people can see the same thing and have a different perception? <laughs> you know two people can experience a similar situation and both come out with different perspectives about it? But not so with the faithfulness of our God. Once he has personally revealed himself to you, it leaves such a mark on your life that everyone will be able to understand and know that it was the faithfulness of God that did it. I need you to understand that. Anybody been marked by the faithfulness of Almighty God? I had to look at that word a little bit differently than I'd ever looked at it before. Faithful. It is defined as constant or true to one's word or promise. How many of us are true to our words and our promises? All right, now that's all right, be honest. Jesus reassured his disciples in the first gospel of the New Testament, Matthew 24, 25, that the grass withers and the flower fades, but my words will not pass away. No, no, y'all didn't hear me. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. That's the blessed U-turn, everybody. God's word will remain forever impenetrable. No matter what happens, God's word stands the test of time. One of the attributes of God is immutability. And when I first heard that word, I couldn't even say it. Just means unchanging. <laughs> Amen. He cannot change. But the worth of that is what we need to shout about. We want to shout about the things that God does. And that's good. That's good. And that's okay. And I think it's all right to do that. And I don't think God faults us for that. But we need to, we need to satisfy God by praising him for who he is. And worshiping him because no matter what, he will be God forever. He is faithful till the end. He does not change. He does not change. And in this season, don't you think you need an unchanging God? <laughs> it is of his mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies are everlasting. His compassions are fail-proof and manifest themselves each and every day of our lives. Did you wake up this morning? Mercy. Did you get yourself great dressed this morning? Mercy. Did you drive your car or take public transportation this morning? Mercy. Are you sitting in this sanctuary this morning? Mercy. Did he bless the choir to sing this morning? Mercy. Did he bless the scriptures to go forth this morning? Mercy. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a faithful God who cannot fail. Come hell or high water, yes, he remains the same. His word is impenetrable. He is the rock. 
rock of ages. He is a fortress, a mighty fortress is our God, the rock of our salvation. Jesus is that rock. He is our firm foundation, a fortress to those who take refuge in him. Has anybody taken refuge in the God of my salvation? That's not enough for you to tell you about his faithfulness. I want you to know his faithfulness is unfailing love. I said unfailing. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. His love for us is unfailing, as vast as the heavens, and as wide as the clouds are across the sky. His faithfulness fills the expanse. Has anyone looked up into heaven and looked at the clouds, and have you been able to look beyond them? No, because that's just how great our God is. His faithfulness expands the universe. Have you tried him this morning? Do you know him to be a good God? Do you know him to be a loving God? Anybody deficient in love today? I want you to go to John 3:16. Y'all know it. Can you say it with me? For God so what? That he what? That whosoever what? Shall not what? But have what? Hallelujah, that's his unfailing love. He does not love this physical world. He's not coming back for this physical, tangible world. He's coming back for blood-washed saints of God. You and me. Because his love compels his son to go all the way. Not part of the way. Not some of the way. But I said all the way. I say it like this. God took everything out of heaven's vault and put it in his son and then sent his son down four to two in generations just to save you and me. If you want to get it a little more de definitive, he bankrupt heaven. It said he sent his one and only son for what? To save worthless humanity, you and me, we are the product of God sending his only begotten son. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we become the inheritance of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but one day we shall see him as he is. And we shall be with him, but that's unfailing love. That's love that's willing to die, giving up the ultimate. I, I, I just can't fathom it. But if that's not enough, everyone, to prove his faithfulness, because sometimes you need more evidence. He's an anchor. <laughs> in the times of storm, you know how it is when the disciples were in the boat and Jesus was down in the hinder part? And the storm got a little boisterous, and they couldn't see any way to get themselves together. And they went down and said, Jesus, careth thou not that we perish? And Jesus came up and said, ye of little faith, still the storm, calm the seas, said, peace be still, and everything was all right. That's the anchor I'm talking about. As the storms in your life arise, and they will, I want you to know if you live in this world, you're going to have a storm or two. I want to give you some medicine. Y'all go fill your prescription. Cling to him. Hold on to his promises. Know that he is good for his word. Know that his word can be banked upon. You can take it anywhere, and it's fail-proof. It'll do just what he said he will do. When he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, guess what? He won't. 
when he said the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him, guess what? He does. <laughs> if he said, I'll take care of you always, even until the ends of the age, guess what? He will. When he said, if you cast all your cares upon me because I care for you, guess what? He does. If he says, call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not of, guess what? He will. If he tells you that all things work together, I said it again, all things work together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose, it's true. I can't tell you how many promises in his word we can stand on as an anchor to secure us when times get a little shaky when the waves get a little rough when the storms get a little crazy I want you to cling songwriter said hold hold to God's unchanging hand I don't know about you but I'm holding to God's unchanging hand the billows may roll the breakers may dash but he's holding me fast we got to hold to God What may he's faithful to the end? He never made a promise that he did not keep. Hallelujah. Hebrews reminds us that he has given us his promise and his oath. Those are two things that he has given us: his promise and his oath. And both of them are his character. They are immutable, they are unchanging. God will not lie. Matter of fact, that's it. But you know what, Nadik? He can because he's God, but he chooses not to. <laughs> because we say he can't, but in actuality, God can do anything. But he will not lie. And I want you to know that everything that goes on in this earth, God won't do anything without us. <laughs> he won't do anything without us. So if you don't pray about it, he ain't going to do nothing about it. <laughs> That's what the word says. That's what the word of God says. If you don't pray about it, he's not going to do anything about it. If you let it go on, guess what? God has to let it go on. Do you know why? Because this world does not belong to him anymore. The prince of the air has dominion over this earth right now. We have been redeemed. You and I, the blood washed, blood paid for children of the living God, we have been redeemed. But this world will have to pass away. <laughs> He's going to give us a new heaven and a new earth because this world is corrupt. And I don't care what you do, it's going to remain corrupt until the people of God take an authoritative stand. We got to deal with the stuff that Satan is throwing out. And we got to be serious about this. There is hope in his faithfulness. Because God will keep a remnant in the world. We are that remnant. Any remnant survivors today? Anybody survived pandemic? Anybody survived some death in your family? Anybody survived some financial tragedy? Anybody survived some losses? Anybody survived some job losses and downturns? Anybody a survivor today? If you are a survivor because of the faithfulness of God, you need to stand and give God some praise. And yeah, I know you're saying don't take all that, but let me tell you, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done, know he's an on-time God? Anybody know he's a way-making God? Anybody know he's a delivering God? Anybody know he's a saving God? Anybody know he's a door-opening God? Anybody know he's a keeping God? I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you this. Hold! Hold on! Hold on! Hold on to the faithfulness of the God of my salvation! I don't know 
know about you today, but I trust in the God of my salvation. I just have to share one more thing with you. You can be seated. Hallelujah. I, I, I remember the commercial. I remember the commercial. It was a coffee commercial. I can't tell you what coffee it was because I don't drink coffee, but I liked the commercial. It said, good to the last drop. Maybe you might know what that coffee is, but that's really not important. Have you ever tried it? And I said that I was going to try it just to see if the testimony was true. But the one thing I can say as I take my seat today, that I've tried the faithfulness of God. And I say to you today, like I say to anybody else, oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. Oh, my God. 